started. Got it. We are joined this evening by Julia Reed, who is running for state representative position one. Wow. Julia, please go ahead with your two minute introduction. Sorry, there's a little background there. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Julia Reed, and I am running for the Washington State House of Representatives here in the 36th Legislative District. Um, I grew up in Seattle uh, as a teacher's kid, and I've been working in public policy for my whole career uh, in the Obama administration and also here in the city of Seattle. And I'm running for office because I feel like our state and our city are at a turning point. And so many of the things that brought my family here, um, our good schools and our welcoming communities and our creative workforce are just at risk of being lost. And that's because of choices that are being made in Olympia that keep resources concentrated in the hands of the few that keep us from realizing the shared prosperity that our state really deserves. Um, I grew up in Seattle, but I've also worked abroad in the Obama administration. So I bring a global perspective to this work, which I think is especially important in the world's most export dependent state. I'm fiercely committed to housing. I think that there is no greater issue that is gonna have an impact on the economic future of our state than solving the housing crisis. I wanna to work to solve climate change. I want to work on workforce development, which is my particular policy area of expertise. I know our city has problems, but this is my home. This is where I grew up and this is what I'm gonna fight for. My great grandmother immigrated to Seattle in 1880 and she lived in the 36th district. And if you elect me, I will be the first person of color to represent this district in the legislature. I think the 36 is home to some of Seattle's most iconic waterways and some of its best sites. And I wanna make this a district where everyone can thrive. So I hope that you will consider me for your endorsement uh, for the 36 state rep, state rep position. Thank you so much. We will now open it up for our prepared questions. Responses to these are two minutes. And Laura, do you wanna take the first question? What tax reforms do you think are realistic in the next legislative session and what would be your strategy for implementing them? What do you feel is the ideal tax structure for Washington state in the long term? Yeah, so let me take that question backwards. I think in the long term, I really we need to be a state. We cannot continue to thrive as a state if we have the most regressive tax system in the country. It's just not fair that our poorest workers are paying the highest share of taxes while our billionaires are paying nothing into the system. And without those resources, we can't realize our goals on education, healthcare, climate change. The money is there, but we have to have the courage in the state to make our tax code balanced and fair for everyone. I think in the next session, we can start to work towards that goal. I'm really excited to learn from Noelle Frame and to follow her leadership while she's in the state Senate and to build on the work that she's done in the House. I think that we have to continually be looking for progressive forms of revenue. I think we have to come up with a real solution for the gas tax crisis. And I think we have to start thinking about how are we going to ensure that everyone, uh, that our taxes and our state can be more fair so that we can do the things we wanna do. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, why don't you take the next question? Oh, Barbara, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Given falling enrollment over the past two years, our school districts are facing new, a new funding crisis on top of the bare minimum funding levels uh, in place before the pandemic. What will you do to ensure that our schools are fully funded? Yeah, this is really important to me. Um, I'm a teacher's kid. My parents worked in public education in Seattle and in Shoreline and Edmonds for their whole careers. My mom worked in special education, which is a really chronically underfunded source of education. 
Um, I've done a lot of work with work-based learning and career and technical education programs, both at the K-12 and the community college level. And I think that's important to flag too, that it's not just our K-12 system that's underfunded, but our community college system is really in a crisis and really important institutions like the Seattle Maritime Academy, uh, which is based right here in the 36, are in danger of shutting down forever. I'd really like to see us move to a statewide maritime academy that can provide access to good maritime jobs for women and people of color. That's something that I want to work on to sort of build up this resource in the 36. But in terms of, of fully funding our public education, I think it all comes down to priorities. And for me, the priority is our students and our educators and our teachers. I think it's also about ensuring that we have programs that students want to take. I engage with a lot of students in my job who are feeling after the pandemic like they don't see a lot of point in learning Macbeth or learning trigonometry. And I love Macbeth, don't get me wrong. But I think students are looking for a more hands-on approach to school and a way to make their experience feel meaningful because they have just been through this massive trauma together. Um, and I really want to see us invest, especially in our work-based learnings and career and technical education programs. I love trigonometry too, Pat. <laughs> and, um, because I think that was one way that will help keep students in school and on path. You know, we have, in order to really fulfill the jobs of the future, we need 70% of our high school class of 2030 to be, or our high school class to be earning a post-secondary credential by 2030. We're only at about half of that goal right now. And post-secondary credential attainment has to be a focus for our state. Thank you. Jerry, can you take the next question? Did you say Sherry? Thank you. Um, Thank you. How have you worked to reduce climate change? And specifically, how will you take ambitious steps to address the largest drivers of climate change, greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, well, I think if you've seen me uh, out and about in the district, you might have seen me on my Readmobile, which is my electric bike, which is my primary vehicle. It's got my campaign signs on it. Um, so anywhere, <laughs> you always know where I am in the 36. Um, so I think one of the ways that I have really chosen is to try to reduce my own greenhouse gas emissions and to adopt greener modes of transportation. But I also realize that that's a privilege that's given that I can afford to purchase an electric bike, that I can afford, that I have a job that allows for me to travel at flexible times of the day. Um, that's not true for a lot of people. And I think especially for women and people of color, people who already feel that your body is kind of vulnerable in society, just telling them like, gosh, you should just get out on a bike. And I don't understand what the big deal is, like, isn't really going to be something that's going to be a solution. So I think it's not so much the state's role, it's more the city's role to invest in on the street um, bike lane infrastructure. But I want to continue to push for more of our transportation funding to go to green transportation alternatives. I really want to complete the electrification of our ferry fleet. I really want to push for full electrification of our ports. Um, I specifically want to work on climate resiliency for communities. So I'd like to see the state use our cap and invest funding to create a grant program for cities to make their infrastructure plan the extreme weather impacts of climate change. So extreme smoke, extreme heat, extreme cold. These are things that communities are feeling right now. They're disproportionately felt in communities of color and low income communities. And just as we're fighting really hard against carbonization and for decarbonization, I think we also have to help cities cope with the challenges that they're facing right now and ensure that our infrastructure is resilient. Exactly. Because even if we cut off all greenhouse gas emissions today, we'll still have 10 years of extreme weather impacts to deal with. Thank you. David, why don't you take the next question, please? <clears throat> In addition to the climate, uh, crisis. King County has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, and our entire state is facing a housing crisis. Do you agree that we need to add additional housing, and what will you do to ensure that all cities in our region are building the housing we need? Yeah, I'm really committed to increasing housing availability. Um, I'm 35, and me, my friends, we're all living the housing crisis every day whether it's trying to buy homes or trying to find stable places to rent. 
Um, this is something that is constantly on our minds. And I mentioned earlier, you know, we have the fewest units of housing per household of any state in the nation. And if we don't build more housing, we are not going to be able to survive and thrive economically in the future. Um, I really believe in the expanding inclusionary zoning. I think that it doesn't have to mean huge apartment buildings on every block, but I do think modest housing choices like duplexes, triplexes, mother-in-law units, making it more affordable for people to build ADUs are essential. I think we should upzone areas, and we have really in Seattle at least, upzoned areas in our urban villages and our commercial spaces first. But frankly, there's just not enough room if we just rely on urban villages alone in order to provide housing so that people's kids can live near them, so that they can have their parents move into the same neighborhood as them. I know people who want to live and stay in their home neighborhood, and they can't afford it right now. And part of that reason is because there is such a low availability of housing. So I'm a really big proponent of increasing inclusionary zoning, just because I think that the future of our state really is going to depend on it. Um, did I answer both parts of the question? Sorry, I got a little off track on zoning. Um, and one other thing I would add just on homelessness is that, you know, I really believe that homelessness is a housing crisis. Uh, there are other problems that people on the street and frankly, the face and frankly, people who are housed face some of those same problems with addiction, mental health, mental and behavioral health mm -hmm. issues. Um, but in order to get right, in order to be able to embrace treatment in those areas, people need to feel safe. They need to have a door that they can shut and lock and they need a chance to be secure. Thank you. We're now going to open it up to our uh, questions from the executive board and these responses are one minute and Pat, your question is first. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, so I have a, a follow up on the, uh, Julia, on the issue of um, upzoning. Um, I mean, would you, would you support like elimination of single families uh, uh, zoning and say having like duplexes or triplexes be the default uh, zoning in the city, like similar to what uh, I believe was Representative Bateman's bill was? Yeah, I think Representative Bateman had a really good bill. And I, I support inclusionary zoning across the state. And I think that that is really going to help us have a better, more economically sustainable future. I know it's a big change for all of us, but I think it's the best way we can have really vibrant neighborhoods. Um, I live in Lower Queen Anne, and here is a neighborhood where we have single family homes next to apartment buildings, next to multifamily homes. And I think it's a beautiful, vibrant neighborhood. And I think we can still protect what we love about our neighborhoods and make it possible for our kids and our elders and our future generations to live and move there. And then includes just a follow up inclusionary zoning. No, there's no follow ups. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. No sorry. All right. Yeah, you asked for Sarah's wielding the gavel with, with <laughs> <That's great>. fierce. <laughs> yeah, you're happy to get in line and you can get in line again, though, Pat. Um, Stephanie is the next question. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, Julia, I'm curious. Um, all of the things that you talk about are. Um, are issues where you may have to work um, to build consensus and potentially work in a bipartisan way to get things uh, passed. And um, I'm curious if you have any thing that you would like to share about how you see building um, enough power to make those changes. Yeah, I mean, I've worked in government pretty much my whole career. The last two years, I've been a social impact consultant, but prior to that, I've only worked in governments. So I have a lot of experience in consensus building and um, building bridges across different agencies, across different points of view. I think also as a person of color and as a biracial woman, that kind of consensus building and trying to really look at things from other people's point of view is something that I do both as a survival technique and a lifelong practice and is something that sets me apart from the other candidates and something, a lived experience that I can bring to the state house that I think other candidates can't, that will serve me really well when I'm trying to um, build consensus with my neighbors across the aisle or in other, or other Democrats in other districts. We know not every Democrat in the state house thinks like a 36 Democrat. Um, and I think that I actually am really interested in specifically positions where I would have to do bipartisan work. I'm really interested in maybe serving on the capital budget committee, which is a real bipartisan committee within the house. Thank you. I think Barbara had the next question. 
Thank, thank you. Um, Julia, um, I'd like to go back to um, housing, building housing. And uh, wait, um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, housing, building housing is a business unless it's nonprofit housing. And in a market this hot, nobody, uh, people can make more money building um, higher income, more expensive units. So um, we, you know, we give set asides and we, uh, you know, at sort of state and local levels, people try to tempt nonprofits into finding a way to, uh, to build units. So what do you think, how would you work for that in the state? What can the state do or the legislature do um, to make uh, funding available for units that aren't built uh, for the profit uh, sector of the housing industry? Yeah, it's hard because um, housing costs are really, it's really expensive to just build right now. Like we have really high building costs, building materials are expensive, labor is expensive. Um, and I do think we need more market rate housing. Um, I do think the lack of availability of market rate housing is a real challenge as well, because you have people who can afford to buy at listed rates, but not when those listed rates are going for $300,000, $500,000 in cash over listing because there's such a small inventory of homes. So I do think we need more of that. I also think the state should really be focusing a lot of its energy on creating that kind of permanently affordable housing stock. I think there's a lot of room um, to consider innovative models for fundraising. I think we're comfortable talking about billions of dollars when it comes to building highways, but not when it comes to housing humans. Exactly. And I think that's a conversation I'd like us to have. And I think the state can be putting money into building housing, permanent supportive housing, permanently affordable housing. I'm really interested in the social housing proposals. So I, there's a lot that I think the state can be doing. Great, Clayton. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, the Associated General Contractors AGC um, is located on Westlake um, and therefore within our district. And I, I, uh, I thought I would ask, what you would like to say to them if you were invited to speak to them um, uh, with regard to our tax structure, because they are both at the core of that conversation and the conversation, any conversation regarding the cost of housing. Gosh, well, I hadn't thought about what I would say to them specifically. I definitely would start out by saying as the granddaughter of some of a very active member of the AGC, um, I definitely know the role that, and someone who, my grandfather was a really huge inspiration to me. He was a community leader in Pasco, Washington, and, and he was a businessman who invested a lot of his work and time into his community, and a lot of his building projects in his community. And he built the church in Pasco that my family goes to and many families go to. Um, I think I would say the same thing to them that I say to everyone. I'm kind of a what you see is what you get kind of person. And I don't necessarily moderate for too many audiences. I think I would say that I think our tax structure is unbalanced. And I think that it's hurting our state. And I think it's holding us back economically. And I think it's making it harder for us to do the work we want to do. That's and I it. think that we that this is a collective challenge. And I hope that they will be on our side. And if they aren't, then I hope they will uh, gracefully step out of our way so that we can make a better state for everyone. I'm and uh, Sarah, we have time for one more question. Perfect. Shep, you are up. Okay, I'm gonna ask you. Thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna ask another housing question. Uh, do, you have any, do you have any thoughts, um, Julia, on how to reduce the cost of building houses? Yeah, actually, or, it's interesting or... you should mention that, Shep. I do have some thoughts that I'm really interested in exploring more. Um, a few years ago, Commissioner Franz came out with a proposal around increasing the building of cross laminated timber structures um, mm -hmm. in our state, which they have just started, I think, building a new cross laminated timber structure in Capitol Hill. 
Um, that's where you're kind of taking byproducts from managed forest harvests and you're turning them into building products, which she also proposed as a way to kind of revive the flagging economic fortunes of logging towns. Um, so you're creating a much greener product that's more environmentally friendly and easier to build and put together. So I'm really interested in that as a form. It's tricky with unions because if you're using a cross laminated laminated product or a, a prefabricated panel, that's something that's being made in a factory and then assembled on site, not necessarily a house that's fully built by a carpenter. But I am really interested in how we can explore some of these building materials and building options that are cheaper than traditional building materials and better for the environment. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you so much, Julia. Please go ahead with your one minute closing. Great. Well, I thank you so much for having me. I will say, I know this is a crowded field and it's really hard to run against friends. And I certainly have a lot of respect for everyone who is running. And it's hard for me to step down as chair of the 36th as well. Um, but I think what sets me apart from the field, if I could just leave you, is that I have the professional experience having worked in government about how legislation is actually implemented, not just how it's passed in the House, not just how you read about it at the press conference, but how you actually turn it into change within government. And I can bring that experience to the State House. I think I also have lived experience as someone who grew up in Seattle, moved away, came back what it's like, the, both that experience of old and new Seattle. And I think I have the experience and ability to bridge both areas. And I think as a woman of color and a, and a biracial woman, as I've said, I think I bring that particular lived experience to the state house. And I think my lived experience and my professional experience set me apart from the field. So I hope I'll have your endorsement and I hope I'll get a chance to work on behalf of the 36. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. And I'm going to...